In a minute, I will tell you why I approach Gerardo. Our first keynote speaker is Professor Alessandro Portelli from the University of Rome. I would like to have a few words written and then add some of my own, uh, because I don't know if many of you know, but uh, <clears throat> Sandro is a very prominent and distinguished person and guest to us, because uh, as I consider him, he is one of the leading person in bringing all history into the realm of history in general. Professor Alessandro Portelli is a professor of American Literature in the University of Roma La Sapienza and author of the text and the voice, Speaking, Writing and Democracy in American Literature, published in 1994. He is even better known as one of the world's leading oral historians. His most recent book, translated into English as The Order Has Been Carried Out, History, Memory, and the Meaning of Nazi Massacre in, in Rome, published in 2003, is a bestseller. He has also published two volumes of seminal or history essays covering topics as varied as Italian resistance, student movement since 1960s, and the Kentucky mining communities. He was recently Simon Visiting Professor at the University of Manchester and is Honorary Research Professor in Oral History at the University of Aberdeen. He is much in demand as guest speaker at conferences in Europe, Africa, Australia and Latin America and for the first time here in Israel. Not many know about oral history. I, I think, Alessandro, I think we are the only one here in history that use all history for uh, our research, I think. Is it true? Yeah. More or less, more or less. Uh, oral history is a new, a rather new, it's not actually very new, but is a very uh, special stream in, in history and is very pertinent to the study and research of testimony. Sandro, <clears throat> please. Please welcome Sandro. Thank you, Zohar, and thank you, Michelle, and thank you, everybody. Uh, this, it's a great privilege and a great responsibility to address this meeting, uh, and it's a wonderful pleasure for me to be, for the first time, in Israel. So thank you so, so very much for having me, and you don't have to listen, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, because uh, oral history is uh, an art of listening and listening to narratives, uh, I think I would like to start with a little story. Um, what I'm, I'm, I'll be talking about um, an experience in a specific place, which is Harlan County in uh, eastern Kentucky, United States, um, a formerly mining community, now an ecological and social disaster area with a rich and extraordinary history and culture. So the story is uh, this lady, uh, this lady's name is Mossy Johnson. She had 13 children and last time she counted them she had about 95 grandchildren, great grandchildren, great great grandchildren. And she is talking about the death of her husband in, a, in the coal mine. She says, well, he went in and he got on his machine and he always tested the top first. So he tested the top and it seemed solid. And then when he got his machine under the top, it fell down on him. And the man with him said he lived about a minute. And all he said was, boys, get this rock off me. And then you know, his co-worker runs to their home and tells them what happened. Uh, and uh, so my oldest son, he jumped out of bed, he was 19 at the time, he jumped out of the bed, ran through the house, and all of us was in shock. So it just made us numb at the time. And then the next day, uh, my husband's daddy wanted me to go with him to pick out the casket. So I went in uh, the funeral home, and it looked like a big field full of caskets. I had to get out of there, so I took off running. 
And then we had uh, his we had his funeral, and I heard people say that there were more people in his funeral than any one funeral they had ever been at, because everybody liked him. He was a likable person. But all I could think about was how much I needed him. All I could think about is I have to get away from here. So we went on the graveyard with him, but it was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life to just watch him, put him down in there. And that was 33 years ago coming, the 13th of this month. So this is, uh, I think, uh, as close as it comes to a trauma narrative. And she talks about being in shock. She talks about being numb. And, um, and there are a number of similar narratives in uh, the Harlan County area. Um, a lady whose husband was killed in a major mining disaster and says she was stunned. Another lady, she says she was cold. Um, a mm, local journalist who interviewed families of victims of a mining disaster found intertwined complex attitudes of anger, horror, questions of why it all happened and how. Yet a degree of numbness prevailed, as it does when the greatest threat of going underground becomes a reality. So uh, on the one hand, we have these narratives of death, uh, sudden death, uh, and there all uh, shaped as narratives of personal and family trauma, uh, traumatic interruptions in the course of life and, uh, and relationships and affections. And on the other hand, however, uh, you have on the one hand these individual narratives of trauma, and on the other hand you have an, a social narrative of death as routine, as normal. Uh, I have, uh, um, well, uh, at least 1,300 men were killed in Harlan County coal mines in the last 20 years of the 20th century. Uh, I haven't met one working class person that didn't have a, a violent or sudden death in the family in, or had witnessed death in the, in the mines or somewhere. As uh, a young lady said, people die a lot. Back, uh, back years ago, it was nothing for a woman to have 12, 10 of 12 children and only have three or four of them live to adulthood. And parents, if they didn't get killed in the mines, they died early from diseases and lack of medical care. Or my closest friend and uh, host there, Annie. Well, my husband's brother died last September with cancer, and then my sister liked to cut her foot off in October, and uh, uh, she liked to bleed to death. And uh, then Johnny died, and then in May, Uncle Charles got killed in the car wreck, and one of my cousins died at the same time. It's just, you know, but there's a lot of good things happened, too. So it's a day-to-day -day basis. But that's another part of survival, because any time a man goes in the mines, when he walks, when he goes in, in the mines, he's working the whole day under this thing, you know, hey, this could be my last minute. And some man puts in 40 years and months every day, you know. If, if a man lasts 15, 20 years in the mines, it's a miracle. And then he's dead with black lung, which is a miner's breathing disease, and don't even know it, you know. So on the one hand, you know, death as uh, a personal disaster, and on the other hand, death as social routine. Uh, death in mining accidents, death by cancer, death by disease, death by car accidents, death by fights, violence, shooting, um, and most recently death by drugs. So one uh, of the questions is, how do we relate uh, this personal tragedy to the social to the social routine. And one of the things that oral history is about is exactly this, connecting the individual to the social. Because oral history is based on the 
one-to-one -one conversation and narrative and life stories and personal memory. So it works with individual uh, documentation, with individual expression. But then, um, if we call it history because we uh, attempt to use these personal, uh, to start from these personal, from these individual uh, narratives and uh, memories to reconstruct some kind of a social framework to, uh, to bridge the uh, dialogue between the personal and the social, the, indivi the individual and the collective. And uh, part of uh, the way this is being done in the most recent developments of oral history is by uh, by uh, stressing uh, the form of the narrative rather than, or at least as much as the content. Um, oral history began rather naively but idealistically as um, an attempt to get closer to the roots of what they called then experience. Let's go to the eyewitnesses. Let's go to the participants. Let's go to the persons that lived it and we will have access to the actual experience. And immediately it was clear we didn't have access to other people's experience. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, the discourse became a discourse of memory. We had access to people's memories of their experience. But even there, uh, this memory is couched in words, in discourse, in narrative, so that the one thing that we do have to work on is the, um, uh, is the verbal uh, construct that people base, uh, create on the basis of the memory of their experiences. And uh, the other, uh, maybe the other paradigm shift in the last maybe 20, 30 years of the oral history uh, movement was the um, realization that if we're working with language, if we're working with narrative, if we're working with the oral, with the dialogue between the interviewer and the interviewee, um, well, what we're striving for is less uh, a factual reconstruction than an attempt to uh, elaborate and communicate meaning, to an, an attempt to create interpretation and to make sense out of the, out of the lived experience. And in this effort to generate meaning and to um, generate meaning in narrative and dialogue, uh, imagination plays uh, um, as important a role as you know, the uh, accurate factual um, narrative. Imagination becomes a fact in itself, and language becomes a fact in itself. Of course, as long as we, as historians, manage to distinguish what is imagined and what actually happened if that is possible. But things happen in people's minds. People, things happen in people's souls and they find a place in the, in the narrative. So how did, how did people deal with the social normalcy of death in, um, in a place like Harlan? Uh, a number of observers have pointed out how, as they say, uh, the attitude about death is much better than in most other places. And I wonder what a better attitude toward death means. Uh, this is a, um, it's, this quote is from a social psychological study of the region, so it means more or less that there's more acceptance. Others talk about uh, a higher awareness of death as a fact of life, or um, uh, one more quote, uh, the, uh, yes, basically the acceptance of death, the fact that it's normal, that it's normal for people to die, and accept that when your people die, it's not normal. 
So how do they deal with this? And let me uh, quote uh, from another narrative. This is a lady whose husband died in one of the major mining disasters, the Scotia mine, where 26 people were killed. And um, and I'm restructuring the order of the quotes so I can find them. And she says, basically, uh, I was sitting at home and uh, and then uh, I heard the siren, and and the siren uh, made me realize that something had happened. And then the news came in. The news came in, and um, and then uh, we will never know exactly what happened. The truth has never been told. I had two daughters, and. Um, well, I married again. We had to keep on living. It was just an accident that happened. Now, what is interesting about this, this quote is she just does not mention what her state of mind was when her husband was killed, when she got the news that her husband had been killed. Uh, and I think she's moving between two uh, two la levels of, uh, of discourse. One is the unspeakability. Uh, she cannot uh, tell, uh, tell me how she was feeling at the time. Number one, because I hate to ask a question, you know, how does it feel, as they always ask on television. And number two, because, because it was really um, unspeakable. On the other hand, one of the reasons why it was unspeakable was that well, you just go on, and uh, you um, you sort of uh, you survive, and survival ha is the key word in all the uh, Harlan County narratives. Uh, the first time I went to Harlan County, I was told by uh, friends uh, who were active in the civil rights and the union movements to check out a place called the Cranks Creek Survival Center. And uh, because I'd heard about it from, individual, from intellectuals, I thought you know, survival was a metaphor. It was some kind of cultural center. I went in, and it was ceiling high with baby food. It had been established after a disastrous flood. And the purpose was really to keep people from starving to death. So I remember you know, talking about, uh, about it with one of the organizers, and she said, no, survival is not just a word. Survival is the main core of the struggle here in Harlan County. Because the reason I had gone to Harlan County was that Harlan has a long tradition of radical union struggle, especially in the 1930s, and, but also uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and I was expecting something that some of us call the class struggle. I went there, and the unions had been wiped out, and uh, uh, the mines were closing, but people were still struggling. And the struggle had, was taking place in terms of survival. Uh, as soon as the little babies are born, uh, my friend says, um, all the odds of survival are against them. And if they don't, don't die from hunger or from cold, uh, they get killed because of all the home remedies we give them, you know, all the folk medicine that will kill them. And, um, the cancer rate in this county is probably higher than any other place, uh, and nobody cares whether we, live, we die or not. And women have a higher rate of cervical and breast cancer. So, and survival means uh, you know, the uh, trying to protect the environment from strip mining, from mountaintop removal, from clear cutting of the forests, from um, from floods from flooding and uh, and uh, how uh, how uh, do people then cope with this one thing is the so called fatalism it was just an accident that happened and if you read 
any sociological uh, discourse, uh, treatise or book or anything about uh, Appalachia, the mountains of Appalachia where Eastern Kentucky is located, they will tell you that it's a very fatalistic culture. I mean, uh, you can die any time and as um, uh, the uh, one of the most uh, important and active uh, uh, local doctor says, he says, there's a lot, of, a lot of understanding of death as something that God has decided when you are going to die, and you die then. Oftentimes, I'd be taking care of someone in the hospital, and I didn't really expect them to die, but they died. I didn't think they were quite that bad, and they die. And the family response will usually be, well, it was God's time for them to die. So it's kind, again, kind of a fatalism, like there is nothing we can do about it. It's the same theme, you know, it's out of our control. The, uh, when their time comes, they're going to die. And I think the key phrase here is out of... It's out of our control, because they're talking about God, but there are other powers that are active in, the, in that place. Uh, one, uh, so one of the ways in which uh, the, this connection between uh, disaster and routine is uh, handled is by uh, symbolism and ritual. Harlan is one of the places in the United States, it's actually the place where it began, where they practice this ritual of snake handling. Uh, they take literally a, a passage from Mark's Gospel that says that uh, part of the signs of the blessed will be that they will take up serpents. And they do. So they bring certain snakes to church, poisonous snakes. Um, rattlesnakes, copperheads, and they take them up and they pass them around and they wrap them around themselves. And uh, this is, I think, um, clearly a metaphor for the fact that they're handling death every day. Uh, the uh, uh, snake handling becomes a metaphor for the uh, omnipresence of tragedy uh, and the fact that it's really beyond your control or at least they feel that it's beyond their control. Now, however, how does um, oral history help here? Because we all, we're all aware that uh, there is um, a therapeutic um, implication in narrative. There is a therapeutic use of narrative but oral history's uh, role is not therapeutic. Uh, oral history's uh, field is history, trying to f find out how the culture and the, and the social relationships evolved through time. So um, one of the uh, uh, things that then oral history does is we uh, help us locate this relationship with death uh, and survival in historical context. And uh, I have a number of quotes here. Uh, this man, Donald, Donald Hensley, he's a uh, Pentecostal preacher, but he remembers when in the 1930s, uh, during the worst of times, a, a communist union came to Harlan County and for a couple of years people joined a communist union uh, and he says they turned to the communists because they were trying to survive and one of the leaders of the union said it wasn't a strike it was a war against starvation for survival Reverend Brown Methodist preacher and uh, chief of police also one of the, a former bodyguard of President Nixon. And he says, when the unions were trying to get into existence, people didn't want to, the unions to exist and people who did, I guess you would call it a struggle to survive. No union, then the people could be done any kind of way, but with the unions, people could bargain for wages. So, uh, 
suddenly you have a sense that um, survival it has always been part of the of the class struggle. Uh, that people have accepted maybe the idea of death, but have fought to to survive. And in many ways, in many ways, because on the one hand, you know, uh, survival uh, is, al uh, is also uh, an effort to remove the awareness of danger uh, from, your, uh, from your mind. Uh, William Gent, uh, a former Vietnam um, veteran, and he is talking not about his own death, but about killing. And he says, you put a mental block in your thought and you eliminate it as you're doing it. After the first few kills, in a way, it gets a little easier. So the numbness that Mossy Johnson is talking about is also um, an instrument of defense uh, when you're handing, uh, handing out this. Or, um, I don't know if any of you have seen, you probably haven't, this um, documentary uh, that uh, won the uh, Academy Award in 1977 by Barbara Koppel. It's called Harlan County, USA. And in Harlan County, USA, uh, if you've seen it, you, you may remember this very powerful woman, Lois Scott, who at one point, uh, she's an ample woman, she drags she dra a gun from her breast, says, if I'm going to the picket lines, I'm going with protection. And I talked to uh, Lois Scott and Lois said my daughter was dying with lupus at the time she was dying and maybe that is one of the reasons I threw myself into the struggle because by being into, in the struggle I could somehow not be thinking all the time about what was happening to my daughter so here you have a, a relationship between the mental block the uh, uh, the fatal is the, the struggle for survival in the union and the and the presence and the presence of death. But uh, what uh, connects this uh, so-called fatalism to uh, to the historical background is exactly the fact that the people in Harlan County were not fatalistic. They did not accept existing uh, social conditions uh, passively, they uh, are very much aware of the, of the need for safety in the mines, they are very much aware of the need to do something about the drug epidemics, so that uh, it's, it's actually a very active and um, militant in many ways culture. So how does it connect with fatalism there. And I think the key phrase is out of our control. Fatalism is not inbred in the culture. Fatalism uh, is a consequence of the fact that all these struggles have so far uh, ended in defeat. The union has been wiped out. The environment has been destroyed. Not, uh, the Harlan County is a test market for deadly prescription drugs. So that uh, the sense of powerlessness is, is pervasive in an, in an area that has struggled. Uh, one of the basic books on uh, Appalachia by John Gaventa is Power and Powerlessness. So the attitude, the fatalistic attitude toward death and disaster is uh, indeed a consequence not of, you know, not, not of the fundamentalistic religion, not of uh, rural traditions, of folklore, it's a consequence of politics. It's a consequence of a state of uh, things where American citizens who are supposed to be uh, the freest people in the world have no control over their own lives. As uh, Annie Napier said, you are taught from the day you're born that you cannot fight a coal company, that you cannot fight a lumber company, that you have no rights. 
Now, this, and this, of course, is a woman who fought back. And um, the sense of having no power, of having no rights, becomes the historical foundation of uh, the fatalistic attitude toward death. If you can't, you can't do. You can't do anything about it, not because it's God's time, or maybe, but because, because there's no safety committee in the mines, and there's no safety committee in the mines because the union has been wiped out, and because you have to accept uh, work at those conditions. So uh, how does that connect with, uh, uh, with historical work? I think it connects, uh, on the one hand, with realizing how uh, the uh, historical events, the history of the history of mining, the history of lumbering, the history of the environment, affect the attitudes of people toward their own lives, and how the uh, sense that uh, you can't do nothing about it is. Uh, generated by um, by power relationships, the uh, attitude uh, b uh, that allows individuals to bridge the personal trauma and the social uh, tragedy is precisely a question of power. Uh, the uh, Mosley Johnson knew very well that the reason the roof of the mine collapsed on her husband was that uh, they were robbing pillars. Robbing pillars is an operation where after you mine a vein, uh, you know, the roof is sustained by pillars of coal, but then after you finish, you take away the pillars that sustain the roof because that's precious coal and you want that to, to retrieve that too. And as you do that, the roof collapses. And um, Seven people died in a Utah mine two years ago for that reason. So that um, the greed of the operators, that caused 25 people to die in May 20, in uh, West Virginia last uh, two months ago, or uh, that caused Mossy Johnson's husband to die, is uh, the root of much of the personal and collective tragedy. So, the, uh, the sense of powerlessness then uh, is also derived from the fact that you have no political representation, no political uh, means of affecting this. I remember, and I will close with this because my time is almost up, I remember this, uh, uh, the, uh, well, when I first told my friends that I was going to Harlem, my friends in the U.S. I started getting emails and letters. Well, no email. No, there were emails, and I've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, letters. Uh, don't go. They they kill sociologists there. And my response. In fact, not a sociologist, but uh, a TV operator, documentarist, had been killed for filming things that uh, people felt were undignified. Uh, so I wrote back, I'm not a sociologist, so I'm okay. But um, uh, after a while, I realized that you know, people that were supposed to be hostile to, fo to foreigners were very friendly and hospitable. So I finally asked one lady who was a, who's a poet, and she works in the mines. And I asked her, um, why are people so nice to me? Why are they? And she says, well, number one, you're not from New York. Uh, you're not from Chicago. Uh, that is, you're not a, a member of the, you don't come from the places from which we've been exploited, uh, stereotyped. And she said, missionarized to death. And um, so I'm, she, does, she doesn't perceive me as, you know, representing some kind of power. But then she said, if you, were, if you were a coal miner from Wales and you came here to talk about mine safety, people would listen because 
coal miners there are very much aware that mine safety legislation and regulations are much better in Britain, wherever they are, than they are over there where there's hardly anything. So people would listen to you if you came here to talk about survival. But you're only trying to gather a little knowledge and people are happy to help. And that was a great lesson in the methodology of oral history, which means uh, I realized after this conversation that when I, talk, when I called people up or, and asked them for an interview, I never said, I'm here to study your culture. Because studying means, you know, top down. Uh, I instinctively said, I'm here to learn about your culture. And oral history is a learning and listening experience. Uh, you may be a professor, which is my case, and some of the people may be illiterate, which is a, a fact, but they know things that I don't know, and that's why I'm there. And the other implication was um, that my real contribution to the dialogue was my ignorance. If I knew everything beforehand, people would talk to me. Uh, but the fact that I didn't know and that I wanted to know, that, that I knew enough to ask questions or that I knew enough to shut up when uh, necessary, uh, that was my contribution to the conversation. So that ultimately, uh, the, what she taught me there was that uh, the basic technique, there's no technique to oral history. What makes it possible is a recognition of difference and a desire to learn about it and to listen to other people. And if you listen, what happens is people will tell things that they didn't even know they had to tell. They will go into some of the, some of the death stories, some of the narrative stories, some of the snake handling stories, uh, the trauma of people who died from being bitten by the snakes. And they thought, you know, that uh, how, uh, they must be guilty of something if the snake bites them. Uh, some of these stories hadn't been told before. And the only reason I had, they hadn't been told is nobody had asked. But most of all, when they started telling them, people turned away. Uh, in oral history, you don't. In oral history, you, you listen and learn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandro, for a most interesting and touching uh, presentation. If there are any questions, please. Uh, please speak aloud. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that uh, your lecture was a very good example of why uh, all kinds of disciplines coming together is very fruitful. My research deals with poetry written by soldiers, and I could identify 100% of everything you just said, but I've never heard of Harlan County, so that's just a comment. A uh, question about what you said about oral history, that it being a combination of, of actual historical facts or maybe of occurrences, and the imagination of the person speaking. And I wanted to ask about what you meant by imagination, because um, when we think of imagination, we think of making up things, you know, inventing things, you know, metaphors or similes, uh, beautify, maybe in a way, in a, in a way to beautify actual events. And there's a uh, attention there where you said you were going to a survival center and you expected a metaphor of survival, and what you got was actual survival. Yes. So I wanted to say that maybe, maybe it, that kind of attitude also necessitates a change of how we think of imagination, not of, as a me metaphor for imagination, but of a combination of uh, amazing of the two. Uh, well, uh, I've been boring people for 35 years by telling the story of uh, the, the only reason I got involved into, in oral history was that in, my, in the town where I grew up, uh, there was a case where a young worker was killed by the police and everybody told the story wrong. And I said, there must be some, see, because I didn't come from history, but I come from literature. And in literature, you don't throw away a good story just because it isn't factually true. Uh, but you ask what it means. So, um, by imagination, by
basically, I mean, a range of things going from the imagination you need to put into words the actual experience, you know, even if you're telling uh, you know, quote unquote true facts, you need imagination to be able to uh, put them into words. And then also imagination in terms of uh, telling you know, uh, stories about what you think has happened or what you wish had happened or uh, I don't go as far as including lies but even lies imply as Huckleberry Finn teaches us some imagination so uh, the uh, you know the stories that are not factually true are uh, in a way affect themselves uh, they're not true stories but they're truly told and if we as as historians um, try to the best of our ability to establish what actually happened and then we see uh, how it deviates from what actually happened we can see in that space the work of subjectivity and, uh, and creativity and, and imagination but we have to know both uh, basically you know, I think so, sometimes I think we do the work of the historian we try to find out what happened sometimes we can and then we do the work of the anthropologist we try to find out what people's cultural constructs are and then we do the work of the oral historian which is we try to connect the two why do certain events generate certain attitudes which is a case of uh, you know, um, how powerlessness gener is gener generates fatalism and, it, and back Thank you please <clears throat> one can also see imagination a way of picking up information which is not perfectly conveyed and elaborating and making it to a whole. I would like to mention three films here uh, on the Holocaust. Jacob's, uh, Jacob the Liar, the train uh, the train to freedom of the, in the um, life of beautiful. Where it's very clearly not true that's through the distortion you get the truth. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the, uh, one of the criticisms uh, of Life is Beautiful, which I think was ridiculous, uh, the criticism, not the film, which I, uh, was that uh, if you're talking about Auschwitz, it was not liberated by the Americans, but by the Russians. However, if you're talking about myth, uh, it has to be an American attack. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it makes sense in in that way, um, and uh, and of course, imagination is not the exclusive precinct of artists. It's a basic function of human beings, unless by education we destroy it. But um, uh, so that yes, be, uh, it's the artistic fun in in oral communication, you do not have the kind of separation of uh, genres that we have in the academy or in literature where fiction, non-fiction, the essay, uh, the aesthetics are uh, an essential part of the, uh, of the transmission and creation of knowledge. So that um, Inventing a good story is, yes, very often a way of telling what actually happened. In the case of, my, of the Terni narrative, the fact that people had told the story wrong actually told the truth about the meaning of what they were doing, of what they, they thought they were doing, which could not be told uh, uh, other than by uh, a metaphor, by a symbol. I've been waiting to ask you this question a long time. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of questions about your specific lecture, but I have a more general question about your participation in this conference, because I see this very strange divide between the fields of oral history and the fields of Holocaust testimony, the fields that I work in, I'm in the history department here. And I, I find it fascinating and, and kind of 
um, unexpected, unexplained, because the, the, genre, the source is very similar in its form, and the process of analysis is very similar. And yet there's very, very little dialogue between the fields. Um, uh, people in oral history, don't, um, in Holocaust testimony, don't cite you, and in oral history, they don't cite Professor Lau, um, except me. But I, um, there are different claims about why this is so. so uh, somewhat, one uh, researcher says it's because oral history is an ego genre where, uh, where the informant is telling about themselves, whereas in Holocaust testimony, the informant or the witness, they have a different title in Holocaust testimony, is speaking about an event. Um, another claim is simply that they develop in different political environments that oral history identifies with the feminist movement and with leftist movements of the 1960s, whereas uh, Holocaust testimony identifies with trauma and with Jewish interests. Uh, another is that there is a sort of sanctity uh, which is wrapped around the Holocaust, which isn't around the other events, and so oral historians have a more relativistic perspective. Um, I have my own ideas, but I really want to hear what you have to say about this. Well, uh, I'm very honest to write uh, the entry on oral history and the Shoah for uh, uh, public uh, for an encyclopedia in the United States, and I don't know what what to do really. Um, uh, however, my take on this is uh, I have no objection to the use of the word testimony or to the use of the word witness. But I always use narrator, because I think that even in uh, Holocaust testimony, people are talking about themselves, about their own experience, about what happened to them and what was on their, in, in their minds and in their hearts and their souls. So that, um, I, well, I accept the word testimony in, uh, in a religious more than a historical sense. It's testimony because, well, as one of, one of the uh, people I interviewed, one of the Jewish people I interviewed in Rome, uh, he said, uh, well, it's a funny story, but he came to my office to do the interview, which I usually don't, and I, it was 2, 2 p.m. and I said, uh, have you had lunch? And he said, no, because the only thing they had at the bar downstairs was ham. And he said, normally I wouldn't mind, but the interview is a mitzvah, and therefore uh, he didn't. Um, so uh, there's a, uh, especially I think in the Holocaust testimony, there's a sacred dimension. And I'm saying this as a totally lay, non-believing person, but there is a sacred element which is not necessarily there when we're talking about coal miners. Uh, however, uh, other than in religious sense, uh, the word witness to me and the word testimony means that you're talking about something else, uh, something you've seen. And, uh, well, Holocaust survivors are not talking about something that they have seen. And they're talking about something that happened to them and that, uh, and that they have seen as it was happening to them. So I think the connection is very powerful, it's very strong. And, I, and uh, um, I agree that we should uh, read more uh, of each other's work, but some of the important uh, works on the Holocaust testimony are part of the, you know, the, the toolkit of, uh, of oral historians, or they should be. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Just one hand up. Please. Well, in Harlem, they do perceive death as part of the cycle of life, 
and, but the problem is when your husband or your son dies, you, don't, you no longer see it as a part of the circle. It's a breach in the circle of life. So um, I don't know enough about uh, Eastern cultures. Sometimes I wonder if uh, the idea that Eastern cultures have an easier death acceptance of death is not a Eurocentric uh, projection uh, and orientalizing uh, attitude. But I don't really know uh, very much uh, very much about it. Uh, one thing that makes Harlem different from New York is the type of religion there. Um, of course, New York has everything, but uh, Harlem has a tone, uh, a, a religious tone, which even if like, there may be a few Presbyterians in Harlem, but they are much more like uh, Pentecostalists than they are like the Presbyterians in New York. The emotionality, uh, the uh, well, the sense of danger. Uh, and uh, the fact that um, death is like the uh, interface between a very dramatic natural world, uh, the landscape is very dramatic, and, uh, uh, and a very dramatic supernatural world, religion is very dramatic, and death is what connects those two elements. That is very is specific, I think, to that part of the United States. As for factuality, of course, uh, people will make up things and think that they're factual. Um, excuse me if I make a, a, an Italo-centric reference, but in Italy we have a prime minister who invents things and then is convinced that they're real. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Gatti? Gatti? Some of the stories you were mentioning, some also in the Holland article, are about forms of social suffering that have a framework, a narrative. Perhaps there is a problem with meaning, but there is a form, there is a form to them. It might be a mining accident, it might be uh, uh, illness. I was wondering what happened or ever encountered in the in the interviews, forms of suffering that were closer to the stricter sense of trauma, that is of denied suffering without recognition, that denied suffering, or suffering without a framework to, to tell it. And what did, and if it happened, what did people do about it? How uh, you did know, they have a narrative? Did they? What uh, did they denial, maybe not. Uh, although, uh, you know, the quote from the lady whose husband died in the Scotian uh, disaster, uh, she doesn't deny it, she just uh, uh, bypasses it in the, in the narrative. Or, uh, the, the first person I, I quoted, Mosley Johnson, she keeps telling these very dramatic stories, and each story ends with, but we had a good life. And, but on the other hand, the reason that they had a good life was that she doesn't put it in so many words, but that between her husband and her, there was a lifelong love story. So, uh, in the end, yes, she died in the mines, yes, my daughter committed suicide, yes, another daughter died, but, but, but we had, and, and this is much more uh, intense and credible that all the stories, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a cliche in the, uh, in the cultures of poverty to say we were poor but we had love. In this case, she, does, she never says it, but she, uh, you, you can sense that love uh, shaped uh, her life so that it made her, it didn't enable her to accept death, but it made it created the framework. So I do, uh, I do think that you know, the, in, in oral history, as opposed to trauma studies, uh, you talk to people who do talk, and uh, and therefore when they talk, they they do create a frame. Uh, sometimes you have silences. Sometimes you.
hear people who refuse to talk. Uh, that didn't happen to me very, uh, that much, but uh, the silences, the omissions. Uh, one case, which I think, which I purposely left open, uh, the man that I was quoting who says, you know, you put a mental block uh, who talks about Vietnam. Uh, I was told he wouldn't talk about Vietnam if his mother was there because the stories were so bad and her mother's nerves were so weak that she couldn't hear it. And in fact, his mother was there. He didn't talk about Vietnam. Um, and then later on, I saw him and his mother wasn't there and he told me the story. And I've often wondered whether it was because... Um, because of, of her mother's, of his mother's nerves, or because the story was made up, and he wouldn't tell a story in front of his mother because his mother told, knew that she had, that he had never been to Vietnam, and I purposely didn't check because the meaning of the story is somehow uh, not the same, not independent, but the story is meaningful in either case. You know? So, in, in that sense, probably he is. Uh, if the story is true, okay. If the story isn't true, he is making up a framework for traumas that he cannot express. So it's even more meaningful. I want to ask you after 20 years of uh, interviewing people in this community and uh, the continuous stories and the uh, really difficult uh, experiences that people share with you, and when I, when I look at you and I see a person with so much uh, feeling and uh, something that is so much uh, flowing in a way, what is the impact on you after so many years? Or if you can say something about what's happening to, to you as a person who interviewed them for so many years? Clearly, psychologist. <laughs> well, uh, one of my... Uh, one of the ways in which I've uh, sort of uh, synthesized the oral history experience is if you don't come out of an experience changed from what you were before, if you don't come out of an interview a different person than you went into, uh, then you've wasted your time. And each of these conversations has been uh, uh, implicitly, you know, I never stopped to think, okay, what have I learned? What have, but uh, I'm the result of all, of all this. Um, um, in terms of how they see me, uh, I mean, it changes from person to person. Uh, I have a, I have a long-standing relationship with this one family because uh, I've been staying at their home for uh, every time I go, and. But I'll tell you the little story, because <laughs> uh, one thing that's happened to me is I cannot, I can, the only way I can explain things is by telling a story, uh, which, which is how they do there, and which is how Auerbach says they do in Jerusalem. So, uh, and the story is, um, I called these people at the survival center, and they said, come over, and ten years later, uh, my friend Annie, who is the daughter of the, uh, who is the sister of the organizer of the Survival Center, said, after you called, my sister called me and said, this guy is coming. What should we do? And they discussed it, and the final conclusion was, if he ain't too stuck up, we'll talk to him. Too stuck up, you know, too arrogant, too, um, and uh, so it took me another two years before he asked Annie, what made you think I wasn't stuck up? Now, Annie uh, was, unfortunately, a marvelous woman. She uh, had two daughters. The two daughters had three children with different fathers, and she raised them all. Her husband was disabled, and she raised her husband. Uh, she worked in the factories. She helped with the survival center. She played the guitar. Uh, she would drop everything to come with me and do the interviews. Uh, there was only one thing that she just didn't have space for, which was cleaning the house. And the house had not been cleaned for, I think, 25 years, literally. So um, 
when I asked her what made you think I wasn't stuck up, she said, you came in and you didn't look for a clean place to set your butt on. Meaning, uh, I guess, that uh, she saw me as accepting them as they were. And, and, um, and they've become my, fam my, my kin folks. I mean, in a way, I, I feel closer to them than to my own sister. So uh, that's the kind of... On the other hand, uh, other people have seen my work more in terms of setting the record straight or being heard. Uh, I never say that we give voice to the voiceless because they have the voice. Uh, otherwise we couldn't record anything. But uh, what they lack is an ear, somebody to listen to their voice. Uh, so uh, a number of people see me as, as a channel between local knowledge and See, here I am in Tel Aviv talking about Harlan County, you know, and, um, and uh, also as somebody that has the technical uh, tools to uh, disseminate their note, that has a tape recorder, that has a computer, that uh, things like that. So, in a way, uh, the uh, there's a definition of uh, oral history as shared authority. And, um, and I think they, where I see their authority and the fact that they know about their lives, the things that I want to know, they see my authority in the sense that I can then write about it and um, allow other people to hear about it and to know. Um, but uh, 
also because I believe that uh, well if you have to be faithful to the narrative you have to be faithful to the quality of the narrative not just to the content and uh, too often uh, a misunderstood sense of uh, objectivity uh, causes a wonderful oral narrative to be turned into an unreadable written page. That's treason, uh, because because as I was saying, the aesthetics is part of the uh, of the meaning. So uh, so yes, imagination as a way of seeing, imagination as a way of organizing your material, and then if you make up things which is absolutely permissible and desirable, then you you say what you're making up and what you're not. Uh, I had a big argument uh, with uh, a filmmaker in Rome who was doing uh, uh, a film on the Shoah for the schools and when he didn't have the actual footage he would use uh, footage from uh, fiction and I kept telling him look at least put down, you know, make a, a, a note, this is from a fictional film. Um, and they said, no, because we want this unity of emotion. And you cannot generate um, honest emotion by dishonest means. You know? So yes, use fiction, but call it fiction. That's, uh, that's the, only, the only caveat. Yes, please. I was wondering if you could say a little about what changes over time in the process of speaking to people repeatedly. Just you know, interview someone once and then that be it, as opposed to you've been going back to the same place for decades. Um, and so I'd like to hear some of what kind of happens in terms of the richness of the stories through the kind of process of time and repetition. Um, well, uh, I don't do that too much because uh, I've always prefer to have a broad range of uh, testimony rather than um, focus on a few. Uh, however, there are people that I've, been, that I've talked to for 25 years, and in Apier's one case, I don't think in 25 years she ever told the same story twice. And, and uh, uh, we would sit in her living room uh, with the television going full blast, and she would uh, be holding a cigarette in one hand, which eventually killed her, and coffee in the other hand, which helped. And um, I would just turn the tape recorder on and we'd chat. And um, uh, basically, uh, in her case at least, she, I don't think she told the same story twice. I have re-interviewed people occasionally, and you can see that um, there's sort of a, uh, a skeleton that um, that is stable, that uh, and then uh, the skeleton is dressed in different ways. Uh, often it depends. You know, the problem is uh, it's the same people telling the same story to the same person. Very often changes in the story depend on who they're talking to. You know, I was just. One of my students was just telling me the other day that her, her grandfather tells uh, very heroic stories of his role in, uh, in saving Jews from persecution during the war uh, to the family. But when he talks to his friends, his stories are much less heroic because, of course, of <laughs> well, not because the friends have heard about it, but because the friends have the same stories, so they, he doesn't have to brag with them or to uh, put himself up as a hero. They're just as heroic as he is. Whereas with his grandchildren, he, he's creating another, another image. So I think a lot changes according to who they're talking to. Uh, I have, um, yes, I have used, uh, uh, in a couple of cases I've interviewed some people who had been interviewed before. Uh, my favorite uh, example would be the most uh, reactionary mine owner uh, from the 30s, the, the last man to sign a union contract in the United States. Very proud of this. And in the 
interview he did with a historian from the University of Kentucky, he's, it's very factual, it's very, it's very much in terms of how you organize the mines and the camp. Uh, in my interview, at one point I asked him, did you ever employ, employ black people? And he got up and he gave me a book which was a list of the slaves his family owned. And he told me the story of, uh, of his family as a slave-owning family from Alabama, which is not in the other interview, uh, and um, which allowed me to make a connection between the paternalistic narrative that he told in the other interview, how much he cared for his people and the slavery background. So it really depends on, uh, on the fact that if you're talk or uh, you know, all the women that I talked to who were uh, the widows of uh, the men killed in the Nazi massacre in 44 in the Foster de Atene, they had always been told, interviewed as witnesses who, uh, to their husband's life. I, told, uh, I was interviewed them about, interviewing them about themselves, and the stories that came out were stories of sexual harassment of these widows that hadn't been told before. Now, I'm absolutely sure that if the same people that I interviewed are interviewed by somebody else, they will tell stories that they, it, they didn't think of telling me because, because it's really an encounter of agendas. You know, there are things that, you, that are on your mind, there are things that are on people's minds, and, and you meet, and sometimes they over, mostly they overlap, but not always. And if somebody comes along with another agenda, then they will overlap in a different way, I think. Uh, the last one, because I think he's uh, working very hard already. <laughs> yeah. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Snake engine. And I tried to picture it. And as I picture it, I remember that you said it's a metaphor. And then I become aware of the fact that uh, the snake can bite me momentarily when I hold it. So maybe there is another aspect to it. And this is the solidarity and the identification of those people with the other people that go, the coal miners, that go down to the mine and they can get killed momentarily, as you described from many of your interviews. So when they are holding the snake, it's not just a metaphor. They are putting themselves in harm's way yes. on a purpose to get a bite and to experience the same danger and the same risk and the same catastrophe that they are compatriots or colleagues or the whoever is family, the same people. So they, they may be another aspect of snake handling, not only a metaphor. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, and I use the word metaphor uh, loosely. Uh, what I meant, uh, for one thing, people die literally. Uh, I don't think that they're uh, there to, in order to get a bite. They're there in order to exercise control over the fact that they can get a bite. And just as when they go to the mines or when their husbands go to the mines, they're not there to get crushed by the roof, but they are there to exercise control over the danger of death. In that sense, it's a metaphor because of the similarity. But yes, you're absolutely right. What they're doing is putting themselves in harm's way just as they are throughout their lives and exercising control, uh, which they do because they know how to handle snakes. Um, but also, um, as one of the people I talked to, testing God, testing God, uh, testing how far God will let uh, snakes go. Um, and here is one, uh, there is one uh, case of snake handling in uh, central Italy, uh, a ritual of snake handling. However, they use non-poisonous snakes or when they catch poisonous snakes, they take their poison tooth off. So that's a metaphor. Uh, what we're talking about in Kentucky is both a metaphor and real death. And I think that's the difference between, you know, 
uh, a symbol oriented uh, uh, re uh, religious tradition like Catholicism and the literal interpretation of the Bible as in uh, American fundamentalism. Thank you very much, Professor Potelli. Thank you. And I want, to, I want to thank the audience for the rich exchange of questions. This is what actually we encourage in this conference. We'll have a break of 15 minutes upstairs here, and we'll reconvene in 15 minutes' time. Thank you.